Well, welcome to Front Range. My name is Ernest Smith. I'm the lead pastor, and we're so grateful that you're here. Whether you're joining us in the room or you're in the courtyard or maybe you're watching uh, from home, and we're so grateful to have you. And it's our hope and prayer that this will become a home for you, a place where you can build community, discover your purpose, and grow in your faith in Jesus. Uh, I want to speak real quick to the men in the room. Hey, guys, we have a men's retreat happening in two weekends. So not next weekend, but the weekend after that. Uh, man, I'm excited. I'll be there. Uh, we have a, a crazy amount of activities planned. It's going to be awesome. So if you are a dude, you need to be there. Uh, so women, if you have a guy in your life, like elbow him, make sure you can go to frontrange.info to find out more information, or uh, you can go to that connect tent that Sherry just talked about. Uh, but guys, if you're looking to grow in your faith, if you're looking to build community, uh, anything like, or just have a blast, then make sure that you are there in two weekends. It is going to be so much fun. I can't wait to see what God's going to do as well. Today, we are, uh, are continuing a series we started last week called Winning the War in Your Mind. What we're is we're looking at how all of us have these soundtracks that we play over and over, soundtracks that really control uh, how we see people, how we see ourselves, and, and ultimately what we end up doing. Things like, man, I'm not good enough, or I'll always be whatever it is, or I'm a failure, or I'm not a good parent, or I'm not a, my, my marriage is never going to be whatever it may be. And there's these soundtracks. And I want to encourage you, if you're looking for an additional resource for this series, there's actually a book called Soundtracks by John Acuff that I would highly recommend. Soundtracks by John Acuff. Uh, a buddy of mine the other day, I just read this book three, week, uh, three weeks ago. And a buddy of mine the other day said, uh, give me your five uh, best books of all time. And I actually put this one in that top five. Uh, that's how powerful it was, at least for me. And so if you're looking for ways to, uh, man, to kind of stop the negativity and the, maybe some of the crazy that goes through and that controls you, uh, then maybe grab that book. But that's what we're dealing with in this series. And I believe today, um, we've had incredible feedback last week and even after the last service, but I believe that today, what we're going to talk through, we're going to go through some very practical steps. And if you, if you implement these steps, I firmly believe that three months from now, six months from now, 12 months from now, you're going to look back and go, man, my life that day began me on a journey that has changed my life forever, that has transformed how I see myself, my other relationships, my marriage, name it. I guarantee that. There's not a lot you can guarantee, death, taxes, and this. Uh, and so um, I, I, with that in mind, I thought, man, let's just start off by praying. Father, we come before you. I thank you, God, for your goodness. I thank you, God, for your mercy in our lives. Thank you that you allowed us to have another day. Thank you that you've allowed us to be here, whether in person or through technology. I thank you, God, just for how great you are and your graciousness to us, Father. And we pray that today you would speak to us, that, God, you would prepare our hearts, Father, for digging into your word and hearing from you, God. We don't want to hear from, from Ernest. We want to hear, God, from you. And so we ask you to speak loudly, boldly into our lives, and may we be forever changed. We thank you. We give you glory in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, do me a favor. Close your eyes again. Close your eyes again. I want you to kind of picture yourself on a journey. Close your eyes. You're, you're outside. Maybe you're doing uh, yard work or maybe you've been playing a sport or maybe you've been on the water, but man, it's hot and you need something to drink or, or you need some food. And so you walk into the house. It's nice and cold, air conditioned. You look on, on the counter and there's a, a basket full of oranges. So you grab one of those oranges. You're like, man, I... I could eat some other things, but this is going to be perfect right here. You begin to peel that orange. And once you get it all the way peeled, you kind of break it apart. You put the first bite in your mouth, and it's so good. Citrusy, yummy, so good. All right, open your eyes. If you're a real human, you're salivating right now. Like literally, some of you are like, I am actually salivating. Why? Because your mind is a powerful thing. Your mind actually can control your body. It can control the response of your body. So if you actually went through that process with me, your mouth would be salivating because your mind is that powerful. Scripture even talks about the power of the mind. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to Romans chapter 12 with me. If you don't have a Bible, no worries. It's going to be on the screen. I would encourage you. 
Download the Bible app. It's one of the greatest resources out there. And they've got reading plans. They've got a daily verse uh, for each day. I and mean, there's all kinds of, uh, of tips and tools that they give you a, a part of that Bible app. But we're going to look at Romans chapter 12, two verses. And these verses, I think, are so transformative if we take them to heart. Verse 1 says this, Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. So the author says, hey, true and proper worship isn't just coming to church on a Sunday and singing a few songs, clapping along, maybe raising your hand, something like that. True and proper worship is offering yourself as a living sacrifice. It's saying, God, here I am. Take all of me and all my mess and all my goodness and everything that I have, here I am. I take myself as a living sacrifice. I give you myself, do whatever you want to do in my life. Now that's really challenging in our culture because there's so many things that press against us. There's so many distractions, there's, there's pain and challenges and there's so much that for us to say, God, every day, every moment of the day, take me because man, my, desire, my desires may not match up to God's desires. What I want to happen today may not match up to what God wants to happen today. To say, to, so to say that, God, here I am, I wanna be a living sacrifice, man, that's hard, but Paul says that's true and proper worship. So how do you present your bodies like this? We'll look at verse two. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. So don't be like everybody else. Don't think like everybody else. Don't act like everybody else. Don't, don't uh, uh, adjust yourself and your thinking and all of that to the way everybody else thinks and the way everybody else sees. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be what? Say it with me. Be transformed by the renewing of your, say it with me, your mind then you'll be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. So if you wanna present your bodies as a living sacrifice, if you want God to be able to use you, if you want God to be able to do great things in you, how do you do that? Well, you don't conform to the pattern of, of the world. You don't think and act like everybody else, but how do you not do that? Well, you're transformed by the renewing of your mind. There's a correlation between what we think and what we do. That's what scripture is teaching us here. There's a correlation between what we think about and what we actually end up doing. If you think that this way, then you're gonna act this way. I see this in counseling all the time where people say, well, Ernest, I, I, I want a greater faith in my life or I want a, a better marriage or I wanna get over this addiction or I want whatever it may be. And they can want that all day long, but they'll never do those things until they begin to change the way that they think. Until you transform your mind, there's no way that you'll actually do what you want to do. To say it another way, if you don't control what you think, you'll never control what you do. If you don't control what you think, you'll never control what you do. Now, let me give you the easiest illustration with this. It's working out. Now, this is my weight bench. These are some of my weights, and I chose eight pounders because anything more than that, I might lose my breath up here. So... Because uh, I'm not very strong. But uh, the, did you know that the number one uh, New Year's resolution, the number one by far, like not even close, the number one New Year's resolution is getting healthy, working out, something like that. So people will say, man, I want to lose weight or I want to uh, climb 42 14ers, uh, or I want to run a 10K, or I want to look like The Rock, you know, something like that. Uh, so whatever yours. <laughs> and where'd y'all find that personal picture of me? That's mess. Take that thing off. You don't know how long it took me to do that, that thing right there. It was difficult. That's what you get when you lift eight pounds. You look like that. <laughs> no, but so many of us, we make these, these New Year's resolutions, these things that we're like, man, if I could just lose weight, if I could just get healthy, if I could just eat healthier, whatever it may be. And did you know, statistically speaking, by far the majority of people who make those New Year's resolutions break them by the third week of January. Like we couldn't even get to February. We couldn't even get to the shortest month of the year. We can't make it past three weeks, why? It's not because when we get done working out, we're like, oh man, my body hurts so bad, I just can't do that again. Or you know what, I've spent so much, I've spent all my money on healthy food. I just can't do healthy food anymore, it's not that. The reason why people quit is because they lose the battle up here. Because they can't change how they think, so they don't change what they do. And so we begin to think things like, well, uh, I'm just really tired today, so I'm not, I'm not going to work out. You ever use that excuse for working out or for whatever? I'm just, I'm just too tired. And then 
today becomes tomorrow and the next day and the next day, or we think, man, I'm just not getting the results that I want. You know, I mean, I've been on this diet for a week. I should have lost 15 pounds by now. And you just don't get the results that you want. Or man, Ernest, I just don't have the right genes to look like the rock. You know, or what? and so we use these excuses and we lose the battle up here. And it just reminds us that whatever you think about ultimately is what you do. And if you don't change the way that you think, you'll never control what you do. I see this all the time, not just in, in working out, but I see it in bigger issues. I see people that deal with addictions. Maybe it's alcoholism or it's porn. And we have this conversation about how they, they want to break that. They want to do something different. They want to stop doing what they're doing. But I can give them all the hints and the tricks and all of things. Hey, do this and do that and, do, and all of that. But until they change this right here, they'll never break the addiction. Or people say, well, I just want a better marriage. And I can say, well, I can give you kind of things that Sarah and I do to have a better marriage, but until you change it up here, you'll never have a better marriage. Or I just want to, I want to have better finances. Well, I can show you budgeting and we could talk about those things, but until you actually change the way you think about finances up here, it won't ever impact what you actually do. So how do we control our minds? I mean, if you're anything like me, controlling your mind is really, really challenging. I mean, for me, I, I don't know if you ever found yourself this way. Like I can like be reading God's word or I can be in a moment of prayer or whatever. And somehow I go from God to Yolanda's queso in like five seconds. <laughs> you ever had that happen? You're laughing because you're like, yeah, that was me last night or whatever. Like you go from like really wanting to like press in on God or change your thoughts or whatever. And then like somehow you're way out over here. Like how did I get over here with my thoughts? How do you control your thoughts? Well, it's simple. Is you train your mind to focus. Train your mind to focus. I love this passage in Philippians chapter 4, verse 8. It says this, finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. So Paul says, hey, whatever is right, what, I'm, let, me, let me read this again, because I think it's important. And I want you to evaluate your own thoughts. I want you to evaluate what you think about, what you dwell on. Whatever is true, noble, right, pure, lovely, admirable. If anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Do you find yourself always dwelling on what is right, on what is noble, on what is lovely, on what is pure, on what is excellent, you always find yourself, if you're anything like me, you don't. I mean, for me, on, on a Sunday morning, I, uh, my, my typical ritual, I'll wake up uh, pretty early and then um, I, I wanna read some news. And so I, I jump on some apps and I start reading some news. And uh, this morning, my wife was up and she's not normally up that early with me. And she was like, what are you doing? I was like, I'm reading news. She's like, why? Like, why would you wanna start your day off like that? And I'm like, yeah, you're right. I still kept reading, but I'm like, yeah, you're right. Like there's nothing, we know there's like nothing good on the, like there's no, there, they, okay, whatever is true, I have no clue in the news. Whatever is noble, I know. Whatever is right, no, whatever, pure, like we, what do we dwell on though? Like what are we thinking about? And Paul says here, whatever those things are, think about such things. That word in the Greek to think means to reckon or to calculate, or to take into account, to dwell on. It means to meditate. Paul's saying, I want you to meditate. Meditate? Whoa, Ernest, we're Christians here. We're not supposed to be meditating. Get behind these, Satan. That's a bad thing to do. And I think it's kind of funny why that, that Christians somehow like take something that God created and God commanded, and just because the world perverts it, we think it's bad. Because when you look in scripture, God commands you and I to meditate. In Psalm 1, it says to meditate on the word of God day in, day out. In Joshua 1, 8, it's, we're called to meditate upon the law, meditate upon God's word day and night. We are commanded to meditate. But the problem is, is we've, we've been you know, seduced by the world to think, man, what is meditation? Well, meditation is like Eastern meditation. But there's a massive difference between Eastern meditation and biblical meditation. Eastern meditation tells you to empty yourself. Empty yourself of your thoughts and of your feelings and of who you are and all of that. And I think there's so many issues with, with Eastern meditation, but biblical meditation doesn't say empty yourself. It says fill yourself up. 
Fill yourself up with God's word. Fill yourself up with God's presence. And so Paul's here, Paul here is actually telling us, you have to meditate. And what do you meditate on? You meditate on God's word. Why do you meditate on God's word? Because God's word is a weapon. That if you have strongholds in your life, you have certain soundtracks that go on over and over. And you're like, man, I, I'm not good enough. Nobody loves me. Like whatever it may be that, that keeps going on through your mind, the only thing that will demolish that stronghold is a weapon. And we looked last week at Ephesians chapter 6 that says that there's the armor of God. And there's a lot of pieces to the armor of God that we're to put on every day that are defensive. That help protect you from the attacks of the enemy. But there's one offensive weapon and that's a sword. And we're told that the sword is the word of God. And so the word of God is a sword. And the more that we meditate on it, the more we think on it, the more that we, we reckon with it, that we, we focus on it, that we uh, put our gaze onto it and we begin to live it out, the greater the sword is and the greater we demolish the lies that are going on up here. The strongholds that you and I are wrestling with. The only way for you, you and I to present ourselves holy before the Lord as a living sacrifice is to transform our mind. The only way to transform your mind is to meditate on the word of God. I mean, imagine. Imagine you wrestled with guilt and shame. My guess is, is that most of us, if not all of us, at some point in our lives have wrestled with guilt and shame. Imagine if you wrestled with guilt and shame and the moment that that thought came up that, man, you're guilty. Maybe you feel guilty because of sin. Maybe you feel guilty because of, uh, of what other people have said. Maybe you feel shame because somebody has cast shame onto you or because of something you've done. That you're like, man, that's not who I am. I know that's not what I'm supposed to be doing. And you feel this guilt and the shame. Imagine the moment that that guilt and shame began to arise inside of you and that thought came that you pulled out this sword. And you said, nope, Romans 8.1. For there is now no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. None. And no matter what you've done, no matter what you've been through, no matter how many other people have tried to cast shame on you, that because of what Jesus has done on the cross for you, there's no condemnation. You you don't have to sit in guilt and shame anymore. Or imagine if you felt unloved. Maybe because of the way a parent treated you. Maybe because somebody walked out on you in your life or Maybe just because your faith and you're like, man, I, I don't feel God's presence. I don't think that God loves me. Maybe it's because of my own junk or because of other things and my own belief system or whatever. And I just don't feel like God loves me. Imagine if you, that thought came up in your mind, you just pulled out a sword. You said, no, Romans 8, 38 and 39 says that nothing, neither height nor depth, nor demons, nor angels, nor the past, the present, the future, nothing could separate you from the love of Christ. Nothing. Nothing that you've done. Like you can do nothing to make God go, oh, I just don't love you as much anymore. I just, I, I just, I, my love has kind of diminished a little bit. There's nothing. And imagine the moment you felt unloved. You're like, nope, I got Romans 8 right there. Or imagine you felt like a failure. You ever felt like a failure before? Maybe a failure at work, failure in a friendship, in a relationship. If you're a parent, you have felt like a failure at some point, plain and simple. So imagine in the moment you feel like you're a failure in whatever the situation is. And immediately when that thought began to rise up, you pulled out this sword. You said, nope, Romans 8, 37. You kind of see a theme with Romans? Romans 8 can speak to a lot of issues that we deal with. Romans 8, 37 says, you are now more than conquerors in Christ. More, I don't even know what it means to be more than a conqueror. Like I'm cool being a conqueror, but like to be more than a conqueror, I'm not a failure. I'm not sitting in that lie. I'm not allowing the enemy to put that on me and me to hold that and think, man, I'm just a failure as a parent. No, no, I'm more than a conqueror because of Jesus. Imagine if you had that sword. Or imagine if you thought, man, this sin in my life, I just can't get rid of. Like Ernest, I go to the cross every week at church. I put that sin on the cross every week and I just keep coming back to it over and over and over. And imagine the moment that that thought began to rise up and you pulled out that sword, 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. that says, now there is no temptation that is common to man that has seized you. That means that everything that everybody else wrestles with, man, that thing does not have a grip on your life because God who is faithful promises to give you a way out promises to give you a way out. Imagine if you pulled out that sword and you just felt, man, I can never, I can't ever break this. I'll always be this way. And God's like, what? Do you know what I've done through Christ? Do you know that you've been set free? You are not captive to that thing anymore. Stop it. Pull out the sword and demolish the stronghold. The only way to demolish the stronghold is with the sword. The only way to have the sword 
is to meditate on it, to know it, to believe it, to repeat it. I mean, it's simple. It's really, really simple, but it's not easy. It's really simple because it's God's word. Like just read God's word, know what God's word says, repeat what God's word says. That's simple, but it's not easy at all. So how do you and I have God's word as a sword in our lives to demolish every stronghold that we have in our lives? Well, let me give you an easy, easy process to remember and to walk through. And I promise you, if you walk through this process, you will be transformed. I promise you. Write it, think it, speak it until you believe it. Write it, think it, speak it until you believe it. Now notice what I didn't say. I didn't say surround yourself with other people who will speak truth to you. I didn't say that. Although, if you know me, I believe that's very important. We talk about community here all the time. We talk about being a mentor, getting a mentor, going to counseling. All of that is people speaking truth into your life. However, if somebody speaking truth into your life is actually what led to change, like that's all you needed to change, then you could go to one counseling session, pay that person whatever they, they're owed, and you'd walk out and be like, I'm, I'm changed. Like I am a new person. I will never do those things again. Like somehow in our culture, we think that if we just give a little bit of information, a little bit of inspiration, if we get really excited about it and somebody's like, oh, wow, that was really good. Like we do this all the time with preachers, like all the time. Like, wow, he was really good. It was like, he was just like overly energetic, okay? And he gave you a lot of information. You're like, that's amazing. And you walked out of here like, I'm changed forever. I will never sin again. That's not how it works. So although you need people, you need, I think you, everybody needs counseling. You need community. You need mentors. Although you need all of those things, we need people speaking truth into our lives. That, that alone is not what changes us. What changes us is actually beginning to believe it, to believe the truth that is being spoken to us. The way that you believe the truth is you write it, you think it, you speak it. So about four years ago, I began this journey that we're kind of talking through in this series right here. Uh, and at that time, man, I had crazy thoughts, like crazy. I, like, not like put me in a hospital crazy yet, but like pretty close. I mean, like, I, I would think, like, my kids would, uh, would do something, and I would get angry, and I would respond in a certain way. I'd say something I shouldn't have said, or maybe said the thing I should have said, but not in the way I should have said it. You ever done that before? And so I'd do that, and I'm like, that was terrible. Like, I'm a terrible parent. I'm a failure. My kids are going to hate me for the rest of their life. They're going to get out of the house at 18 or 36 or whatever it is. <laughs> They're gonna, never going to talk to me again, like, ever. Like, that's like where I would go on this, on this thought journey. Like, I did one mistake, and it's like, I'm the worst parent ever. They're never going to talk to me again. Or in my marriage, my, Sarah and I would have a, a conversation. Hey, here's maybe some things that you can change, uh, some ways that maybe you could be a better husband, stuff like that. And I'd be like, all right, that's cool. And then five minutes later, I'm like back to doing the old thing. You know, just like right back at all the old junk or whatever, whatever it is. And I go, she deserves somebody better. She's probably going to go marry Hugh Jackman. You know, like... <laughs> I got to keep you away from my family or else that's going to happen. Like that's where I would go with my thoughts, right? Or like it really, really manifested itself here at our church when somebody would leave our church. They were moving away or if they were going to another church because of whatever reason, I think I'm such a failure as a leader. Like I'm terrible at speaking. I'm terrible at being a friend, whatever it may have been. And like half the time it was people moving, like a buddy of mine, we were texting this morning. He moved to Nashville a few years ago. And I remember when he left, I'm like, I'm a terrible leader. Like clearly I didn't lead him well. Because if you lead him well, you're not moving to Nashville. You're staying here, clearly. And there's some truth to that. I'm going to be real honest. But, <laughs> but I'm like, man, it's not because he didn't love me. He was trying to like help his family. He was trying to like grow his family and help his situation. Had no, how selfish am I that it became about me? But that was where my thoughts went. And so I had a friend that said, well, Ernest, are those thoughts true? And I'm like, I, no, I mean, they feel true, but I know they're not true. Well, is that what God would say about you? No, I know that's not what God would say about you. Then how, do you, how are you gonna change it? 
So I began this process and I, I did the first thing that we talked about last week, I identified the strongholds. Okay, what are the, the things that are on repeat in my head? What are those soundtracks that are going on over and over and over that I keep, like that, man, they just imprison me. What are those thoughts? And we talked about last week, once you identify that, identify the truth that speaks to that stronghold. The truth is found in God's word, not your truth, his truth, the only truth. What does the truth say? about whatever you're dealing with, about whatever stronghold is and, and, and soundtrack that's on repeat. What does God's word say about that? So I did that. And then I began to write these statements and the statements were about me. And I would say something like, um, I am a good father. I love and protect and will raise my kids to know Christ to the best of my ability. And then I would attach a verse to that. So it wasn't just me trying to be positive speaking or anything like that, but it was me going, what does God say about me? He created me, so he knows what he wants for me and what he wants to do in me and all of that. So what does he say? So I'd write this statement about whatever that, that, that stronghold was, that lie that I was believing. I'd write a statement that was usually the exact opposite and almost never did I believe it at that time. Like almost none of these statements that, I, that I'd be like, yeah, that's true about me right now. That's great. I'd be like, I mean, this is what God says, but I do not believe that right now. And I wrote it down. And then I began to dwell on it. Begin to dwell on what God's word says about that thing, that stronghold in my life. And then, and this is the really hard part, I began to speak it. You know, the Bible says that faith comes through hearing. So some of us, we're great learners. We can, you know, learn by reading. Some of us learn just through hearing. Some of us learn when we actually say it. I, like, I'm so bad at learning, I need all three. Like to really get it to stick inside of me, I need to be able to, to write it, to see it, to read it, to speak it, to hear it. I needed all of it to get it to dwell deep into my soul. And it's kind of awkward, honestly, when you've got these statements and you're like going to say them out loud. Like, I didn't want my family anywhere around me. You know, I didn't want them to be like, what's wrong with dad? He's like talking to himself out. Like, and if you're, if you're like me and you grew up in the 80s and early 90s, then you think about like Saturday Night Live with Stuart Smalley, you know, and you're like, you're good enough. You're smart enough. And gosh darn it, people like you. And that feels like super awkward, really awkward. But it began to change me. I wrote these, these truths from God's word about my life. I dwelled on them and then I actually began to speak them. And let me tell you, as a, as a man, I was thinking about this after last service, like I know there's guys in this room right now, guys watching on and like, bro, I'll never do that. That is awkward. If you're married or if you wanna be married, there's nothing sexier to a woman to have a man who is confident in who he is and who God created him to be. And so if that's what you gotta do to get there, to start changing those crazy soundtracks that we all have, then what does God's word say? Write it, think it, speak it, and you will begin to believe it. For me, for some of them, it took months, months to start to be like, okay, maybe I can start to believe this. But now it's been four years, I rarely look at those statements anymore because I did them for so long and they got so ingrained, his word got so ingrained in me that when that thought comes out that, hey man, you failed as a parent, I'm like, nope, I got a sword. It's God's word. I am not a failure. I'm not sitting in that. My kids are gonna love me. I am gonna do the best job that I possibly can. It's gonna happen. And I stand in truth. I stand on God's word. And so if you're like, man, Ernest, I'd be willing to walk through that process. Trust me. If you walk through that process, you will be transformed. If you acknowledge and, and identify what the strongholds are, you find the truth that combats that stronghold, you write that thing down, that statement down, you dwell on it and you speak it, you will begin to believe it. And three months from now, six months from now, 12 months from now, you will be a changed individual. You will be changed, your relationships will be changed. I promise you, but it actually takes us doing it. So where do you start? If you wanna do that, where do you start? It, um, here's what you can do. You could text the word truth to the number that's coming up on the screen. If you text the word truth to the number on the screen, you're gonna be taken to a site that has all the statements that I wrote. And you're gonna be like, yo, Ernest is crazy. You're gonna see that. So take a picture of it, write it down, whatever you need to do. Text the word truth right now to that number and you'll be given a site 
that just is my statements for me. And you might be like, okay, Ernest has 13, 15 of these. That's a little crazy. I need two of them. That's fine. That's just a way to help you get started on this journey. Help you get started on this journey. In fact, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna finish out this message with a few of the statements that I wrote for myself, but I'm gonna speak them over you. I'm gonna speak them over your life because these are, I picked out the ones that I feel like are ones that most people struggle with. You are loved by God. There is no person, no situation, and nothing you do that will change his love for you. Romans 8. You are accepted and worthy. God will never leave you, abandon you, reject you, or walk away from you. Hebrews 13. You are not defined by success or failure. It is what Christ has done on the cross that has defined you. Colossians 2. You are disciplined. Christ in you is stronger than the wrong desires in you. 1 Corinthians 9. You are transformed. Your thoughts and imaginations are subject to the power of Christ. I throw out the bad and dwell on the good. 2 Corinthians 10. And then lastly, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good, pleasing, and perfect will. Father, we come before you and I thank you for your word. I thank you for how powerful, God, your word is. God, how your word can demolish strongholds in our lives. Those soundtracks that go on over and over. So many people over the last week have said, man, this series is exactly what I need right now. And it's because all of us deal with this. God, all of us, because of our sin, because of the world, because of things that we've been told, because of our childhood, whatever, God, all of us deal with these soundtracks that are not of you, with these lies that are from the enemy. And the only way to combat a lie is with truth. And I thank you, God, that your word is truth, that your word is a sword, that it is that weapon for us to fight the strongholds in our lives. So, Father, I pray for each one of us, God. I pray that, that this conversation would spark a desire in us to get healthy mentally. And that we would know that counseling is great and community groups are great and mentoring is great and all of that's great. But, God, we actually have to begin to change the way that we think. We need your word to transform our minds. And Father, I know that this conversation really starts with us first knowing you, that it's impossible to let your word transform our minds if we don't first know you. Know that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. And while we were far from God, we're kind of doing things on our own, that Jesus died on the cross for our sins so that we can be forgiven, so that we can be made new. But there's no newness, there's no transformation without first having Christ. And so, Father, right now, I know there's people in this room or people watching online. If we're being real honest, we'd say, man, I don't have that relationship with Christ. Maybe you've never accepted Jesus or maybe you did a long time ago, but you've kind of been doing your own thing, walking your own journey, not really paying attention to what he has for you. And God's saying today, just come home. Ernest, my sin is too great. No, it's not. His grace is greater. Ernest, I, I don't understand everything. It's okay. He'll walk with you in all of it. Ernest, I'm not perfect. That's why he died for you. And so if that's you, with every head bowed, eyes closed, if you'd say, you know what, today I want to commit my life to Christ. Or I want to recommit my life to Christ. I want to start this journey of getting healthy the right way. I want to come home. I just want you to raise a hand. I want to know who I'm praying for. Amen. Amen. If you're watching online, you could just simply text the word follow to the number on the screen. I just want you to know 
You're making that decision today. It's the greatest decision you could ever make in your life. That God sees you and he knows you. And he's walking with you. He died for you. Father, for all of us, I pray you would tell us what our next steps are. That God, so we would get healthy mentally, that we would stop these soundtracks that, that are not good, Father, that are lies from the enemy, that maybe we don't even realize the impact those soundtracks are having, but God, may you give us revelation. And then, Father, may we know your word. May we write it, think it, speak it, begin to believe the truth of your word so that we can be transformed by the renewing of our minds. In Jesus' name, amen.